Education Finance and Policy Committee to order. Today is Thursday, March 10th. It is about two o'clock. Uh, we apologize for the late start. Uh, session ran a bit over. Um, hopefully members, if we need to go a little bit over time, you can stick around, but we are not taking any votes. So if you do need to go, um, we understand. Um, today, we have a presentation before us. Um, one of the things this committee looks at a lot is how do we make um, education affordable for students? And i um, very fortunate to have a school um, right in my hometown have Recording been working progress. on this and they have some great uh, local partners as well. And so we asked them today to come talk about what they have been doing uh, locally to make school affordable and in a lot of cases actually free uh, for their students. And so uh, with that, uh, President Mulford, we will turn it over to you to begin your presentation. Yeah. Uh, Senator Eric, thank you, um, committee members. First of all, I just uh, again introduce myself. My name is Joe Mulford and I've been the president at Pine Technical and Community College, as um, Senator Rarick mentioned, in Pine City in his district um, for the last seven years. Been a member of the Minnesota State System for an employee of the Minnesota State System for the last almost 25 years. So it's a pleasure to be here. We love talking about what we're doing. Um, to my left and to, to um, with me today to help with this uh, presentation is Pine County Administrator David Minke. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the things that I wanted to talk about is innovation and the things that we're doing in, in higher education, especially to serve the, the uh, individuals in our region. And so David has been uh, kind enough to come down today and, and be a part of this. Just a quick bit about Pine Technical and Community College. So like a lot of the two-year schools, and we're, as I mentioned, I'm a, we're a member of the Minnesota State uh, System. Um, we were founded in 1965, like a lot of the two-year schools across Minnesota in the 60s when they were formed. Um, you know, we primarily serve East Central Minnesota region, economic region 7E. Um, it's about 2,700 students a year participate in um, different types of programming that we have, some of which we'll talk about today. Some of in the higher ed committees or, or through your, your uh, work here as senators, you might hear us talk about FYE or fiscal year equivalencies. That Those numbers of students that we um, serve equates to about 800 FYE. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I always talk about our superpowers at our campus. I think the things that we're really good at and unique for is we're very fast. We're one of the smallest colleges in uh, Minnesota in, and in the Minnesota state system. We're very flexible and we're very focused. And so um, we're not the right college for everybody. We don't have sports, we don't have dorms, some of those things that other campuses have, um, but we are really uh, focused on the students that do decide that we are the best place for them. Um, I, again, a little bit of joking, but our kryptonite things that we struggle with to give you a little bit of perspective on you know, what we, we uh, have to manage as we think about providing some of these innovations and solutions for our region is, um, as a small college, we have a hard time capitalizing things. It's really hard for us to buy big equipment, start big programs, um, you know, do a lot of facilities changes um, like maybe some bigger schools might. Key academic programs quickly, um, like a lot of the two-year schools in our system, we're going to have some of those foundational uh, programs like nursing, um, machining, business. Um, we are a historical technical college. We were Pine Vocational College, Pine Technical Institute, Pine Technical, and became Pine Technical and Community College in 2014. We added the AE degree. <clears throat> Excuse me. A little bit about our students. Um, our students are different than maybe other campuses in our system. 65% um, of our students are part-time. We have a ton of working adults that go to our campus. Um, we have a low income, lower per capita income region. And so our students are um, Pell eligible at a, at a rate of about 63%. Sorry. Um, you can see this, some of the, the primary counties that we serve, both were um, Mr. Minkey's the administrator in Pine County, where we rank in per, act, per capita income in the state. So thinking about innovation and, and kind of why we're here to share our story today and, and, and you know, why we think about these things is, um, we, we struggle like a lot of parts of the state with workforce, you know, so East Central Minnesota and whether it's in healthcare manufacturing, you know, all kinds of different industry sectors, there is a workforce challenge. And one of the things that, um, that you know, we have to think about is how are we going to get more people? How are we going to increase the higher education attainment rate, which is our ultimate goal? We want to get people with skills that are going to give them, you know, better wages, have more flexibility in their career paths, and ultimately meet the, the industry needs in our region. 
And that's a challenge sometimes because of course is a small campus, um, you know, some of the programs that we need to do are, can be high cost programs in those technical areas. And so really the, the areas that we're gonna talk about today fall into a couple different, different camps. The first one is, as we looked around our region, we, we decided, you know, we were trying to decide and, and affect this issue is thinking about two, two really groups of people. One is why aren't more kids, young people going right from high school to college? You know, there's just not enough people going to college um, that to be, you know, and, and get those successful skills. And then the other part is we have a lot of people in the economy that maybe aren't really efficient. You know, they've got the ability to, to do certain things. I just heard this, this piece of data yesterday. It said that uh, pre-pandemic, we have lost 100,000 workers in Minnesota, across Minnesota, that um, the uh, participation, the workforce participation rate has dropped by almost 100,000. And this data person that was given a presentation was talking about that. And that goes right to the group. So if we have people that aren't engaged, whether it's because they've retired or they've left the workforce for some other reason, how do we get them back into the workforce with the skills that are gonna meet where the demand is and, and the employers are? So those are really our two driving forces as we think about um, addressing that workforce issue. <clears throat> so um, some of the, I, there's other things going on at the college, obviously, but uh, three of the things that the innovative strategies we want to talk about, I wanted to share today was really how we're trying to move the needle on this issue. And it really kind of falls into, into these areas around scholarship opportunities for students, providing new innovative programming pathways. So again, really thinking about scholarships targeting students that are graduating high school, alternative programming pathways, whether that's with incumbent workers, dislocated workers, underemployed uh, individuals. And, um, you know, and again, then, you know, also doing some college in the schools work, which helps improve our pipeline as, as students think about going on to college. So I'll just touch on, on these three areas with you. And, and, and David's going to talk a little bit in a few minutes just about some of the, the unique, the way we're approaching this in a partnership with Pine County. Some scholarships, some opportunities um, that we have. The first one is really around a program and it's gotten a lot of attention and some of you that might've been on a, on a bonding tour stopped. We've talked about some of this with you is really the Franzen family. So Dennis Franzen, who um, is the owner of a few manufacturing companies and owns uh, Franzen Bank and Trust, which is through central Minnesota. I think he's got about 35 banks um, supported and got, got a hold of me a few years ago. We started this partnership where he pays, his foundation pays for students that graduate, there's, you know, they graduate from Luck and Frederick, Wisconsin, Pine City, Rush City, and Bram, Minnesota. So he's continued to add schools. So if you graduate from those high schools in our region, um, he will pay for two years of college for, you know, so you, tuition uh, and also give you a thousand dollars that can go towards books and supplies. Those are private dollars that support that participation for students. Um, and so again, it doesn't matter your high school GPA, your family income, it's just, you need to graduate from those schools. The second one, and, and we'll get into more specificity around this, is the, what's uh, called the Pine County College Initiative. And so uh, David and, and the um, board members from Pine County started a conversation with us, I think going back a couple years ago, um, and we implemented it this fall, where the county's taken some federal stimulus dollars, and they have essentially mirrored or matched the, the Franzen program. And so in Pine County, um, Obviously, Pine City High School is located there, as is Willow River, East Central, Hinkley Finlayson, and then there's Harvest Christian Academy. Um, so what the county has agreed to do is, is mirror the program, the scholarship program we had with Franz and Family Foundation. So, so right now, if you graduate high school in Pine County, Minnesota, from any of the high schools or your home school, the home school uh, students are also eligible for these scholarships, you can attend Pine Technical Community College and they'll and, and you'll get two years of tuition plus a thousand dollars to to put towards tools or books or safety equipment or whatever you might have. <clears throat> so those are two really critical initiatives that we've used, and I'll share some data on those here in, in just a few minutes. The third scholarship program is is one that we started again with some private fund foundation dollars. Uh, we have a donor. They they've asked not to be overly disclosed, and so um, some people you know know about them. They're just a very small foundation. And, um, and, and have supported the college for many years. We started a program that's called the Kickstart Program, and that program is available. If you're eligible, you don't have to be on free or reduced lunch your senior year in high school, you just need to be family eligible for that. 
In um, the schools of Isle, Ogilvy, Mora, North Branch, or Sasago Lakes, you get one year, your freshman year would be free or through your tuition be paid, plus you would get $1,000 towards books and supplies. So very similar models. And again, we're using this to try to change, change some of the conversation we're having with those students that are finishing up their, their high school education in, in our region. And then the last one that I think everybody in here is probably very familiar with is the workforce development scholarships that have been legislatively funded. Um, just, I, I'll put in a quick plug. Those things have been critical for us. And so we received 33 of those. We were appropriated 33 this year. Um, they're all out at this point for, for next fall. We've used them all um, and they've been awarded. In some cases, we've been able to leverage private match. And so I listed these at $2,500 because that's what the allocation is. But we, in a lot of cases, make them $3,500. We get $1,000 matches from local businesses and we do it to kind of um, you know, sweeten it up a little bit. So um, those have been really important for us as we get people to get into these industries. Those are not just for high school students. I mean, they're, they're for anybody that's entering those, those high growth, high demand programs. So that's a, a quick snapshot of the scholarship programs that we've got and that we leverage again to try to innovate and, and get people excited about it. Um, this is a quick map. And again, <clears throat> you can see by the color differentiation on there that across our primary service area, of Mille Lacs, Kanabic, Chisago, um, and Pine County there, where are those scholarships lie? So really geographically, we've tried to, to spread that across our entire region, those, those initiatives, those scholarship initiatives. And the, the last thing I'll say about scholarships as I transition to is one of the things that we learned early on, or we, we have learned working with the students that we work with is, um, there's too many times, and, and me included, I'd be in high school and I'd talk to a student, and I maybe even knew their parents. And the things that I would always hear from the students would be really fell into two areas. One would be is, you know, what are you going to do next year? Where are you going to school at or whatever? And, and it really always fell into two camps of, um, I can't afford college. And again, most of the time that wasn't true. I mean, there was, it's not that there's not expense to college, but it was really an issue that Financial aid programs are complicated for students because students are complicated. So, um, you know, a, a lot of the student body that we serve, parents haven't filed taxes, parents are divorced, people are living in other places with grandpa and grandma, and there's a lot going on for them to navigate that system. And it's not that they can't navigate it, but the problem is the decision point for them to go to school is an after action item. And so they have to get through that process to figure out kind of what's college going to cost and can I afford it. So what we tried to do with the scholarship strategy is to front load the decision point for them, because whether we're using workforce development scholarships or whether we're using the friends and um, we could really tell them up front, you know, money won't be an issue for you. At least, you know, you have living expenses and some of those, but the tuition and the fees and the, and some of the supplies and books are going to be covered up front. And so that really changed the narrative. And not just for us, but really for the high school counselors and the shop teachers and those students that are that, that are those influencers in those students' lives, because we really, you know, they've gotten on board with this. And so, and then the second part was really about academic preparedness. And I've always said a lot of our students look in the mirror and they don't see a college person. You know, they that's for somebody else and this family. And you know, there are a lot of first generation college students. And so it's it's helped us. And this is where is and we'll talk about some of these academic program pathways getting students to participate in college experiences while they're in high school starts to melt that a little bit. Cause you tell them, you know, it's like, well, you did this class as part of your high school experience, but that's what college classes are like, you know, because they completed a three credit college class. It just starts to demystify this for us. And I think it helps us move people through that trajectory from high school graduate to, to college participant. <clears throat> So and again, I want to share, you know, some things that are going on outside of that, that kind of K-12 and that high school effort that we've got. And in, because, as I said, I think one of the things that we worry about and thinking about getting more people prepared and capable to work in some of these industries that, that are good paying jobs and really important to the, to the things that are happening, um, it takes a lot of different efforts. And so one of them just quickly is, is incumbent worker training programs. So we have a partnership. Many of you, if you go up 35, you drive Viper Rosenbauer fire trucks and they, they produce some other things. Big employer continue to be very successful and have been growing um, like a lot of manufacturers have a lot of pressure on workforce. 
And so we partner with them. We have trainers, our faculty that go into their facility at least once, twice, three times a month. It's kind of continued to grow. We work with them and um, we do a, it's a manufacturing academy. So they have all of um, their new employees will go through an on-site training program. And it's really given them the ability to obviously get people up to speed quicker. Um, they use it as a retention tool. People see an investment in the, in the employees. <clears throat> And it also allows them to bring in people that maybe don't have the existing skill sets because they can train them up a little bit. So that's been a very successful program and continue to grow over the last few years. Another quick one that I'll talk about is again, I think it's very different is, um, you know, again, in your, in, in your work with the state and in, in your role here in, as a you know, policymaker is everyone's concerned about early childhood, you know, whether there's even existing capacity, we've lost a lot of providers through the last few years. And so we're continuing to try to find ways for people to um, either get into the industry or continue to move up professionally in, in that industry. So um, we have a program that started a couple of years ago, year and a half ago, it's an accelerated program. And this is a unique program because, um, you know, we have a traditional early childhood development program, but this is done synchronous, synchronously so you, so students are, that participate, and these are for folks that are working in the industry, either they own their own daycare, they work for a daycare, they work for an early childhood learning center. Um, they log in two nights a week and they go for 22 weeks. It's a compressed cycle. When we first started, we didn't know if people would be able to kind of handle that kind of volume because they're, I mean, they're starting a lot of times 6.30 in the morning, working all day. They're with very energetic people all day and and, and probably pretty tired at the end of the day. And we've had a, a great success. We've filled four, we're just starting our fourth, fourth cohort of that and we've filled four cohorts. And what we're really seeing that I think is really um, um, exciting is half of those students are continuing on after they're done. So they get started in this pathway and then they're matriculating into our more traditional programming in our full um, two-year early childhood development program, which eventually could transition them to transfer to um, into an education program if they want to go on and be a teacher and get their baccalaureate. <clears throat> and then um, the, the other model that I want to talk about is part of our partnership with Pine County. We really recognized, you know, during the, in the front end of the pandemic and kind of during the pandemic, there was a lot of people in flux. And so they were working in industries that were either closed for a while, shut down, maybe just their volume had changed. And so they were laid off. And that's where I think David, you know, first reached out to us and said, you know, we're trying to find a way to help folks in our region and our county. And so we came up with a program, you know, and just really, it was really intended and built to support people that again, were underemployed, unemployed that either worked or resided in Pine County. And so the, the county used some uh, federal funds again to support this work. And we, we started and we put this program together and it was extremely successful. So again, we had a lot of people that were, that were sorting out the changes that were happening in their life. But, but some of the priorities for us was really, and we use the term stackable. So maybe they were starting in a very short term a nursing assistant course but making sure that that program was stackable into our LPN program, and that stacks into our, our, our RN program. We also, so we did a lot of these short-term pro programs and we tried to create opportunities for them to earn college credit and earn industry credentials along the way, whether it was welding or auto, and, um, which in, and then our processes at the college, some of these were done offsite in different locations. But it also, um, we made sure that they had completed their application and they had gone through it. So if they did decide to matriculate and go into our traditional programs, it would be just a much more simple process for them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Just a kind of summary of what we've done so far, just in the first year that we ran that program. And again, as a small rural area, these are big numbers for us. Um, 37 students completing nursing assistant, you know, and you can see in, in the different programming areas, EMR, you know, we're, all these industries were, were really um, hurting for folks to get into those. In these courses, we've also now seen after the first year about a 15% matriculation rate. So somebody that started in our um, intro to cyber course, maybe it was a short compressed course, has now come back and gone into our full cybersecurity program. So that's really exciting. People have gotten their you know, toe in the water and um, are now decided that's something that they're excited to continue. The other part of our project with, um, with the county 
was to go out and serve businesses directly. And so as part of our, our project with them, um, we've reached out. And so we've done everything from unsurf safe classes for the restaurant industry as they've started to come back online and get opened up and hiring people back. They had new people, they needed some support. And so we've provided some additional training. Again, some of this is at their location, some of it's at ours. And um, just a little bit of a collection of courses that we've been doing. So at this point, I want to introduce and, and uh, reintroduce and, and ask you know, Dave to talk a little bit about maybe the county and, and the role that they saw in this partnership and, and some of these innovative approaches. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Minky, please identify yourself and begin your testimony. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Rarick and members of the committee. My name is David Minky and I'm the Pine County Administrator. Uh, Dr. Mulford has given a comprehensive overview of Pine Technical and Community College our community and the effective programs at the college. Now I will talk a bit about the partnership between Pine County and Pine Technical and Community College. When you look at our county budget, we can divide the pie into roughly four equal pieces. About a quarter of it is public safety, about a quarter of it is health and human services, about a quarter of it is highway, and about a quarter of it is everything else. Nowhere in our budget does education show up. However, I've learned that counties are a cog in many activities that are not immediately apparent in our budgets. And I suspect you know that from talking to your counties and listening to the numerous county officials who testify regularly at your committees. One of the goals of the Pine County Commissioners had 10 years ago when I started my position was to improve our relationship with the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. Out of home placement for American Indian children was an area of easy contention. In virtually every conversation on the topic, County Commissioner Steve Holland would always remind everyone that they are our kids too, uh, making it clear that we have an obligation to them. That focus on the needs and the value of the person has become a touchstone for us. We counties do human development and there are thousands of people we help. They may be veterans in need of assistance navigating the VA. They may be families needing WIC or SNAP assistance. They may be inmates needing to turn their lives around and re-enter society. Every day, the 300 employees of Pine County are helping individuals live their lives better. But we don't do it alone. In fact, we rarely do it alone. Uh, we actively look for partnerships, which is why we are here today. Upon becoming president at Pine Technical and Community College, Joe began reaching out to community leaders, asking how the college can help the community, asking business leaders, what training do you need for your workforce, and asking school districts, how can the county help transition graduating high school seniors to successful careers? The pandemic has not changed the basic arithmetic of the workforce. The workforce is getting smaller and the need for skills is increasing. Technical and community colleges have an important role in educating and training the local workforce. There are no ivory towers at Pine Technical and Community College. There are classrooms, there are labs, and there are workshops training our local workforce. Prior to the pandemic, Joe had successfully increased the focus on training, on training the adult workforce in need of critical skills and made college more accessible to all graduating high school seniors. The pandemic related relief funds have given us the opportunity to build on that work and to reimagine what we can do to help our local economy and give our residents choices and opportunities that will build the 21st century workforce. County Commissioner Terry Lovegren spoke at a recent graduation of the emergency responder class. After the event, she reported back to the board and said, and I quote, seeing their desire to help others is something I was excited to witness. The pride of the people the pride the people are taking advantage of this opportunity to grow, make life changes, and give back to their communities is inspiring. Another initiative we have started is the Pine County Education Leadership Network. Several times each year, we gather the four school boards from the county, the county commissioners, and the college to talk about and solve issues. Uh, to conclude my remarks, I will share the perspective of County Commissioner Josh Moore as he sums it up well. He said, I think we are so lucky to have a partner like Pine Technical and Community College in our county to partner with on these programs. It is a priceless benefit to our community. Thank you and I will answer any questions you have. Does that conclude I, your, uh, or do you have just some a couple more, more slides here. I'll just, okay. the, the piece that in, and um, 
I just wanted to touch on is, is we mentioned, and there's been a lot of talk again across the state around college and the school, some of the programmings, whether that's post-secondary educa education, concurrent enrollment, or some of the other things that are going on. So I just wanna quickly share this as well, as I mentioned in my, at the beginning of the presentation, is some of the work that we're doing is getting those experiences for students prior to graduation. This is part of that self-identification that we worry about. Do they see themselves as able to be successful college students based on maybe some of their life experiences and you know being first generation? And so there's kind of different there's different categories. And just to give you an example of in a, uh, what we're doing right now across our rural region is we really focus on a few different areas. And that's one is having high school students come to our campus and do um, you know, whatever course experience they've got. This can include us doing ITV and interactive television courses and, and across the rural area, you know, it's hard for some small schools to be able to offer a lot of programming. Um, it, it could be our college faculty going out to the local high schools and providing um, academic programming. And to give you an example of how many students we touch, um, you know, we last year we did 100, there was 164 students that, that participated in that type of programming from 31 you know, regional high schools. So we, um, concurrent high school, that's a bigger model for us. That's where it would be a high school teacher teaching our curriculum if they were able to be credentialed in that field. And we serve just under 1,200 students um, last year in that area. It's a very big part of what we do. Um, and then the, the other ones that just to mention is, I think the academy program is something that's continued to grow across the area high schools. And this is where we've got a series of courses and it could be in the medical field, it could be in manufacturing, where students are gonna complete a series, two, three, four classes, and then be able to, um, be able to uh, earn some industry credential. And, and you know, so outcomes, you know, one of the things that we talk about a lot of innovation, how it's going and what we're doing, but one of the things, well, I must've lost the internet there. Um, so a couple of things that, that I think is important to share, let's see if we can get that back. Oh, must have dropped the internet. I've only got two slides left. Maybe I'll just walk you through there versus trying to reconnect. Um, is that our growth over the last few years um, has, has really continued to grow, even in some declining enrollment cycles that we've been in. And, um, you know, our current enrollment continues. We were down a little bit during the two, uh, 2021, and then it's been back up this year, and it's really applications and, and um, uh, registrations for next fall are going really well. So we know that these efforts are helping us to continue to support more students across the region. And then the last slide that I was going to share with you, and I think some of you might have the printouts with you is, is debt. You know, again, we're all concerned about student debt. And one of the things that we've seen across through these programs, whether because of the scholarships, is the continual decline in the amount of students that are required to either borrow money and then those that do borrow um, the amount that they're needing to borrow. So that's been a really great outcome that we've started to see. There's a lag on this data. So this is, I think the last um, data set there is for, for fiscal year 2020. So we project that's even gonna continue to go down for students. And so where you see where we might've been in the last three or four years, for those of you that have it, um, you know, that for students that were completing an associate's degree, there were, um, you know, three or four years ago before the scholarship, 72% of those students would have taken out a student loan. And of those that took out a student loan, their average debt when on graduation would have been around $22,000. In two years later, that number's dropped um, down to only 54% of the students that complete an associate's degree are requiring that. And those that are borrowing are only um, required to borrow 14,900, so it's a significant amount. <clears throat> I've shared this with Mr. Franzen, and he and I talk about this, is that when we think about scholarships, and whether it's the Workforce Development Scholarships or the Pine County College Initiative, I did the math on this, and if you, if you use this chart and look at the amount of average debt, about four or five years ago, for every graduating class we had, there was an accumulated debt load of about $3.2 million from our, our campus, more small campus. That's down to about $1.7 million for fiscal year 20, and I think that's going to continue to go down. The vast majority of our students come from our geographical region. And so when we think about economic development and the churn of resources in our region, there's at least another, those are 20 year loans in a lot of cases. There's a lot of resources that are going to be spent locally on 
maybe a nicer car, maybe a little better house, maybe they start a business versus paying student loans. And so when you think about that $1.4 million savings, because either students have completed more in the K-12 system before they got to us and needed to borrow money, or they're just participating in these scholarship programs, you know, from an economic development, that's a lot more disposable resources in the region to support our local businesses and those students where they live and work, which is primarily in our region. So with that, I'll um, open it up for questions. And again, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you very much. And members, I hope uh, we can stick around. We will go a little over our time being we started late. Uh, Senator Jasinski, did you have a question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, not a question. I just want to uh, thank you for bringing uh, President Mulford in today and, and talking about this. Uh, I think I've been on the bonding committee for six years now, and I've been on the campus several times and really impressed on what you're doing at the campus, uh, what Pine Tech does there. You can feel it. I know you've all been on You can feel the energy when you're on that campus. Uh, just great things, what you're doing there. Uh, and, and just a little off topic, again, great thanks to Dennis Franzen, who's done so much thing for, for, for the uh, community there. Uh, and just unrelated, different, different kind of topic, but we see a lot of people like Mr. Franzen leaving Minnesota because of tax consequences. And it, it just shows what if someone stays in Minnesota, I don't know his status of where he lives and where he does, but uh, there's a lot of people that exit Minnesota and they go down to Florida or Arizona or Colorado and take that philanthropic attitude, what Mr. Franzen brings to this college and it leaves Minnesota. So uh, hats off to Mr. Franzen and you as well, President Mulford, uh, this campus is, is definitely uh, something that every community should be jealous of having because you guys do a phenomenal job there. And I think it's contagious of what Mr. France has done. You're seeing it picked up in other areas, other mm -hmm. cities. Uh, so it's just a great, great thing to see. And uh, again, uh, congratulations on, on a, a great campus and, and a, a great leadership in, in your community. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Jasinski. And uh, talking about the bonding tours, I believe it was on page six of the presentation you saw a semi-trailer in the background. Um, and it is one of the things that uh, I know the bonding committees, when they come and they see, that is where they hold their welding classes. Mm -hmm. It is not inside the building. Um, they have been very innovative and in working with uh, their students and building programs. And uh, so we're working very closely with them to try to do an expansion project so they can grow not only their uh, welding program, but robotics and other um, high-tech areas. So. Um, we, we do appreciate that and that uh, you've been very um, accommodating and open when uh, the different uh, legislators wish to come to the, the school and, and get a tour. So we really, really appreciate that. Um, Senator Claussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And President Mulford, this is the second time you've been at, uh, in front of our committee, if I remember correctly. You made a presentation a few years ago. I, I did. Thank you for your memory. Yeah, yeah. I was invited back, so hopefully it went okay. So. <laughs> but, you know, each time, uh, I've really been impressed how you've been able to bring together the community, uh, local government, uh, for the benefit of students in your community. And it's, uh, it's a great model that you put together. Uh, it's just uh, you're to be congratulated and good work and continued. Um, I do have a question, a couple of questions on, on the, uh, the debt slide that you showed. Um, a question about, we've got 65 students uh, with 14,910. Is there a particular program that those students are in that results in that, that debt? President Mulford. Um, I don't know that I could tell you. I mean, our, our largest program is nursing. So, it, you know, just as an extension, I would assume the, the vast majority of those students that you know, our, our highest graduating group in that two years, in that two years, our registered nursing, our nursing programs. And so I, I'm going to guess it's there, but I don't, I don't know that I, that I've seen that by, by program area. Okay. So I was just curious. So yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, another question I had was, uh, I was around in 2014 when the Higher Learning Commission came forward with the credentialing changes for high school students to do the con uh, concurrent enrollment. It seems like you've been able to, to deal with that. Can you maybe talk about that a little bit? Yeah, thank you for your question. And um, uh, they, so one of the things that we are navigating is there has been a, a change, a policy change at the Higher Learning Commission and, and through the accrediting body for concurrent enrollment programming. This is not just a pine thing. It's a, anybody that's doing concurrent programming across the state 
the credentialing standards don't always align. And so what we run into a lot of times is um, high school teachers tend to get their master's degrees as example in education, which is fine, right? They're teachers where um, if they're going, so they might have their bachelor's degree in biology and then they get a master's degree in education and our credential expectations based on our higher learning commission requires them to have graduate credits in field. So we don't always align to, to the kind of the reality on the ground. Um, it's, it's a big deal because um, starting next fall, so a year from this fall, uh, there was an extension of going back, I believe, about three years ago where that extension. Two or three extensions. Yeah, yeah there's been that. some extensions, but that that day is coming. And so um, we've continued to work with the high school partners trying to get people to engage and get those infield credits. Um, we're, we're starting to really look and measure the impact that's going to have. We're going to lose some programming in some schools. Um, and so it's a concern. And, you know, this, the the solution ultimately is getting more of those high school master's degrees in field and, and our system through some legislative funding. I know that there's to, to, to work on that issue um, from a few years ago. So, but it's still an issue out there. And the problem is, is in a lot of these small rural school districts, we've got school districts that graduate 35 students. They don't have two or three teachers in biology or English. They've got one person. And so you're really, you're limited. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Chair. Um, so are you being a little bit uh, liberal in how you're interpreting that right now? I mean, you've, you've got some maybe teachers that are totally qualified, maybe some that are working towards it. Um, how do you perceive, you know, in a year from now, uh, do, you, do you have any flexibility is, I guess, is the question I'm asking. Um, we don't have a lot of flexibility. The language is fairly narrow. I mean, it says 16 credits in, in field. And so the, the process requires an interpretation of in field. And so, but if the course from their master's degree isn't B, BIO or something, you know, again, I use the biology example, there's not a lot of flexibility around that. Um, and so um, what we are looking at is alternative business, you know, kind of arrangements with those districts that it's just, it becomes very cost prohibitive for the district, the, the, the better option for them is to have their staff teach our cur curriculum, mm -hmm. um, especially in these small districts versus, you know, essentially having their biology instructor just on the sidelines for one hour and our faculty come in and teach. That's, that's where it gets complicated for the districts, in my opinion. Um, it's so it's a harder, it's a harder pressure point for them to be able to do that. Bigger districts can navigate it, I think, but in our area, it's a challenge for a lot of the small districts, especially. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, especially for small districts, that, that's going to be a real challenge, I know. Mm -hmm. I did have another question um, going back where you were talking about, um, again, it had to, to, had to do with, uh, with college in the schools. I won't find it, but I've got it in my mind, I hope. Um, are most of these... The differentiating between articulate articulating agreements versus actually credit granting courses. Um, do you, are you doing both? And maybe you could just comment on that a little bit. Um, Senator Clausen, um, so if I understand the question, we we do have a robust process for uh, credit for prior learning. So maybe they've done some experience through like uh, the example we talked about earlier was like an emergency medical responder. So maybe they took a, a course through their high school and they require they achieved the state certification. Mm -hmm. We would recognize that through that process. So um, the articulation process for us would be from the, you know, from us to a university pathway. So I'm not familiar that we're doing any sort of uh, articulation agreements with high schools. Generally, the way we would address that, if they're getting a CNA because maybe their high school offers it outside of our scope, um, we would recognize that through our credit for prior learning process. The, I think the, the best option, in my opinion, is when students earn college credits, they create that transcript, which is really something they take with them wherever they end up going. Um, and so I, that's always kind of our preferred method if we can. I think it serves students better in the long run, but it doesn't mean that we can't meet some of those needs that they've, or those life experiences they've got and recognize them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Minky, I have a question. Uh, you talked about, you know, Pine County with some of the COVID relief money started the program to help the, the other schools in Pine County who weren't part of the Franzen uh, Foundation. 
Um, does the county have plans to be able to continue that without COVID money or, you know, what are, how are some of those talks going to be able to work with the school and continue some of that programming? Uh, Senator Rare, we have been working and, and Joe has actually been leading the conversation with the school districts about how to make it sustainable. Our goal is that we would develop private sources of funding to continue the program. Thank you. And then um, also, I know, you know, we talk about uh, the Franzen scholarship and the other foundations. Uh, can you talk to us about, you know, how you talked about the students who didn't realize or they don't understand the pathway, but can you also talk to us about what you've discovered with some of these students as they're coming in um, under those scholarships, but what you found as far as the other, say, Pell Grants and other uh, programs that are already available that they've actually qualify for that they weren't aware of before these other programs came into place. Yeah, Senator, thank you. And I think that's a, that was an important point that I, I, I didn't touch on when we went through is the way the models have been built is really a last peer model. And so we apply state grant and then if they're eligible for a federal Pell Grant, you know, so they're, they're asked to go through the financial aid process. And then the difference is picked up by either the Friends and Family Foundation or the Kickstart program or the county in this case. And so we continue to monitor costs and the costs can be very different because some students aren't eligible for any of that. And some students really, they're, there's, they're not getting anything under the scholarship that they didn't already have access to. But this goes back to my earlier comments that one of the struggles that we have with some of the students we try to serve is they don't understand that they never get to that point in the equation because they don't start the financial aid process. They've just predetermined they are not, they can't afford college. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard had students tell me that. They either don't understand the cost, number one, and then number two is they don't realize that the state in Minnesota has been very generous with the state grant program. We have the federal Pell Grant program, and then we close the gap with these, these private dollars or, or public resources like Mr. Mickey's provided. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions from members? If, if not, uh, thank you so much uh, for your presentation today. Um, you know, this is, uh, like I said, I, I know you had been here once before and I know uh, you get a lot of attention uh, around the state and I believe even some national attention uh, around what the Dennis Franzen and that foundation has done. But I think uh, the more attention we can give to this, the better to help uh, I'm sure there are people out there who have not heard this story yet. And um, if we can replicate this model into other schools around the state, uh, the better, because um, I think we all agree, making school affordable for students mm -hmm. is the end goal. Um, high school educations are not enough in today's world. And how can we help them get into, whether it's that apprenticeship program, a tech program, two-year associate program, or four-year how do we help them find that, understand how they can get assistance and then get through the program? So we really appreciate the, you sharing your story and what you have been able to do for the local area and, and hopefully others will see. And, uh, and I know you've always been willing to uh, answer questions for folks that reach out asking advice on how to make it work in their area. Absolutely. So um, with that, uh, we, I know we are over members. Hopefully you don't have a three o'clock uh, committee hearing to get to. Um, again, thank you and we are adjourned. Thanks. Recording stopped. <laughs>